Let us uh, begin. Good morning. It is uh, 6 a.m. in Apia. Good afternoon, 1 p.m. in New York. And uh, good evening, 7 p.m. in Switzerland. Welcome to this online UN General uh, Assembly site event on the treaty body reform and the lessons learned from the uh, outreach session, the extraordinary outreach session of the Committee on the Rights of the Child in Samoa. I'm your moderator. My name is Philip Jaffe. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist and a professor at the University of Geneva. And as you can see from my background uh, at uh, the Center for Children's Rights Studies of the University of Geneva. More importantly, I'm a current member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And as such, I took part in the committee's session in Samoa in March of this year and conducted a follow-up visit to Vanuatu. This experience changed my view on the role, the potential, and the impact of a human rights committee. Also, I can't wait to return to the South Pacific, but that's another story. The aim of this side event is to share and discuss the outcomes of the CRC session in Samoa, and to make sure that the, this event, the first of its kind, informs the ongoing intense process of reforming the treaty body system. Before we begin in earnest, a few housekeeping issues. In about one hour, we will move to the Q&A session. You are of course welcome to ask questions at any point, starting now and by using the chat box. When you do, please identify yourselves along with your question. Also, Please don't even think of leaving early or you will miss a short video performance by the Brown Girl Woke, a Samoan NGO working to empower girls and children. You should also be aware that the full side event is recorded for posterity and you will be informed as soon as the recording becomes available. Finally, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to acknowledge and thank the co-sponsors of the event, the governments of Australia, New Zealand, Samoa, the UK High Commission in Samoa, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNICEF Pacific, the Office of the UN Resident Coordinator in Samoa, and anyone else that may have been left out. Let me introduce our distinguished panel in the order of their intervention. We will hear first by video from the Honorable Tuitama, Dr. Tala Le Lei Tuitama, Minister for Women, Community and Social Development uh, of Samoa. Next, an exciting presentation from four students of Samoa who had significant roles during the committee's session. Ms. Audrey Lee Hung, Ms. Marian Furuan, Ms. Kaylin Bartley and Ms. Denise Margraf. Then we will turn to Ms. Ilze Brands Keris. She is UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. We then welcome uh, Justice Vui Clarence Nelson of Samoa, my friend and colleague, who is also a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. He will be followed by Mr. Miles Young, uh, Director of SPC's Human Rights and Social Development Division. And finally, we will have a video message from His Excellency, the uh, Ambassador of Australia to the United Nations. So panel, here we go. And we begin with the Honorable Tuitama, Dr. Talalale Tuitama, Minister for Women, Community and Social Development of Samoa. As the very first host country for a regional session of a treaty body, we are very keen, keen sorry, we are very keen to hear the minister's views and assessment. So please, could we start? Moderator, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Talofalawa and greetings from Samoa. The 84th Extraordinary Outreach Session of the Committee on the Rights of the Child held in Samoa this year 
was a historic event, not only for Samoa, but also for the Pacific region. Samoa was pleased to not only welcome the committee for its inaugural session outside of Geneva and New York, but also to host our Pacific neighbors, especially from the Cook Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and Tuvalu, who were presenting their reports on the protection and promotion of the rights of children under the Convention of the Rights of the Child. The success of this extraordinary session in Samoa was the result of important collaboration between government, the United Nations, the Committee of the Rights of the Child and its Secretariat, and our regional organizations, particularly the Pacific Community Regional Rights Resource Team. More importantly, the active engagement of the non-government organizations, civil society, schools, and children from Samoa and across the Pacific was essential, providing insights on life in the Pacific Islands. Hosting the CRC in Samoa has increased the visibility on the rights of the child and the specific issues children face in the Pacific region. It allowed for the promotion of the implementation of the Convention and a key opportunity for Samoa to hear the articulation of children's views. Government also used this as a platform to improve engagement and consultation of different stakeholders to feed into our sustainable development goals and human rights conventions implementation and review processes. The extraordinary session served as an extremely learning opportunity for Samoan and Pacific officials, civil society, national rights institutions, and all involved in promoting rights of the child. The opportunity also to learn from participants would not have been able to attend the Geneva sessions given financial and travel constraints. With many Pacific Islands without representation in Geneva, this was long awaited opportunity for our region to engage and share our Pacific realities with a treaty body. Increased participation from the Pacific is of great importance in the work of human rights. Our island contexts and diverse voices provide a different viewpoint that is not often heard in Geneva due to the lack of representation. We firmly believe that one size does not fit all in terms of application and implementation. It is essential to have our say in these United Nations human rights processes. The lessons learned and experienced from the CRC meeting in Samoa is an important input to the current UN human rights treaty body reform discussions. We thank the Pacific community and all the co-sponsors of this important event, as it provided an opportunity to discuss the review and importance of such regional meetings to the effective implementation 
of treaty body obligations. For Samoa as host of this extraordinary session, we looked at the totality of the experience of all participants and coordinated closely with all partners to ensure the participation of the children. The formal meetings, the side events, and opportunities for engagement with communities and people all add to the committee's experience. While Samoa was not being reviewed, hosting the meeting automatically puts the spotlight also on the host country and its efforts to implement the convention and on the rights of the child issues. How this relates then to Samoan CRC reporting and our engagement with the committee is an important point for further discussion going forward and also for consideration of future countries that can host these sessions. We look forward to more extraordinary sessions such as this one and for the Pacific region to a keen play host. This will further the work of the treaty bodies and allow for enhanced visibility, increased participation and better understanding of the treaty bodies on human rights in the Pacific. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Please, uh, uh, please give our regards to the Minister and thank him for this intervention, which highlights not only the extraordinary um, hosting capacity of Samoa, but all the benefits of uh, being able to be close and exchange um, on a first-hand basis. Next, I would like to uh, introduce this special moment uh, as we will hear from, uh, our, from four children of Samoa, uh, Audrey, Marion, Kaylin, and uh, Denise. Uh, all four actively participated in the committee's uh, session. And as rights holders under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, your perspective and takeaways are paramount. How were you involved in the session? What was your experience? And what messages would you like to emphasize? Please, um, Audrey, please take the floor. Um, Talo for everyone. I will get straight into the point. My role in the meeting was I was a moderator for the panel of the health in Samoan context. That was how I was involved. Um, what it meant to me was first, I was made aware of the rights of a child. I always thought that our rights as children were under human rights in general. I had no idea that children had their own set of rights and articles according to them. Second, as a moderator, I was very happy to see that with the help of Sano, who was my first speaker, we were able to encourage a lot of the students that were attending to ask about their health and how it's being dealt with by the government internationally internationally and such and last I think um, it was a great honor to attend because had it been held in Geneva we wouldn't have been able to attend and the committee wouldn't have been able to see how our rights are being held and how we are being affected how we are being disciplined how we are being treated at home, in schools, and in the Samoan community. Um, I think 
three rights that I think that should be enforced or enhanced in Samoa and dealt with is the lack of right, the lack of protection rights for boys. I think that um, a lot of the a lot of the rights for protection from abuse really looks towards girls. And as a girl, I do find that very comforting, but boys as well do experience a lot of abuse. Uh, it might not be physically, but they might be affected mentally. And we should really look into that. The second one is, it's a dream at the moment, but I think that there should be more defense being, defense opportunities and teachings be, There should be defense taught for girls who are experiencing abuse. This it's a dream at the moment, but I think that this is something that we should be teaching in schools. We can't always prevent abuse, but we can protect the girls from it. And that, I think I'll pass it over to my colleagues to carry on with our discussion. Um, my name is Marion Fruin. Um, as my role in the CRC 84, I was a moderator for child protection. Um, what this role meant to me was um, for the first time, we had a platform to voice out our opinions and our expressions on how we felt about our child rights, which is something that is rarely given out. So it was an honor to be a part of this connection, to be able to express all the opinions and the thoughts of our own rights. Um, insights on some of the child rights um, I would highlight would be uh, one, counseling for kids who do go through child abuse. There is only one um, organization that deals with this, which is Samo Victim. It would be nice to see that there would be more organizations or um, more counselors dealing with um, these troubled uh, youths. Also, um, another issue I came upon recently on the newspaper, um, there was a mother who abandoned their child, which later on led to the death of the child. It would be nice to see that these young mothers or the young women have a safe haven where they can drop off their children or their child if they, due to cer certain circumstances, can't take care of them, or they can drop, the, drop off the child without any questions asked. That way, they don't have to go through um, well, the trouble of abandoning their child and that child could be well, fatally consequence. But um, thank you so much for this opportunity and that's all for me. Okay, so um, I'm Kaylin and I moderated on the youth participating, especially in the Pacific, towards climate change. Now, as a science student, I learn uh, based on facts and evidence in this world that climate change is real and it is being um, shown throughout the world, especially in the Pacific. And I just am confused as to why it isn't strongly given attention to, especially to, to leaders who don't emphasize it like as strong as um, it should be, because it is a serious um, problem. Now, I guess you could say it is um, infringing my rights on clean environment, as well as how the advice of scientists and researchers are not being heard. And that is quite uh, discouraging for me as an aspiring scientist. In the future, I want to make a change, but knowing that leaders are not listening to my views, my research that I spend years on working on, 
as well as during the panel, I've noticed that questions asked by the youth, not just me, they're asking panelists who um, front line go against these problems. They ask things like what can they do or what they could do to contribute in the fight. Now, the, they ask these questions because they're a child, they're children. But if these children can ask these questions, why aren't adults, people with power, not asking the same? Um, I was really thankful to have this platform to um, voice my concerns and my views. It was an honor for me to um, participate in this convention. And I would just like to say thank you for listening. That, that would be all. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Denise McGraw. I was selected as a moderator for the side event concerning Pacific cultures and faith and whether they're an enabler or barrier of child's rights. Whilst observing formal sessions and discussions, it helped me in not only learning more about my rights as a child, but it also gave me an opportunity to voice my concerns on issues affecting the rights of the youth. The 84th session really opened my eyes on the importance of having laws that protect and promote our rights as children. The question of whether culture and faith-based values act as barriers or enablers of child's rights is important. However, I must honestly say that there is no right answer, right or wrong answer to this question from my own perspective as a young Samoan woman whose learning and development have been shaped by the teachings of religion and traditions. If I were to say specific cultures and faith are an enabler of child's rights, I'd be lying. But if I were also to say that it is a barrier, I'd be biased towards my own culture and identity. I am who I am today because of my faith and beliefs to distinguish between what is acceptable or not in society. However, beliefs shaped by culture and religion is no excuse to normalize issues such as violence, intimidation, and bullying that we experience within our own society. Physical violence inflicted on children is a global issue. It is present in Samoa. Certain conventions that protect child's rights may oppose cultural and religious ways of disciplining the child. Corporal punishment thus may be the norm and method of disciplining children by the elders. What I can say, however, is that it is important for our Pacific societies to readjust our ways of thinking around these certain aspects of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Studies suggest that there has been some improvement made in promoting greater acceptance of non-violent parenting approaches and alternatives to corporal punishment. I fully support these initiatives where child's rights are recognized. They should be adopted in a way that it functions harmoniously within our culture and faith. It is also dependent on us, the youth of the future, to facilitate the process of promoting our rights in the context of our culture and faith. To conclude, it takes a village to raise a child. Pacific culture and faith will always be the fundamentals of a child's upbringing within a community setting. These aspects of our upbringing are of utmost importance and cannot be removed because it means stripping away our own identity. The process of getting there may be complex, but acceptance and recognition of child rights is possible and can be accommodated within our beliefs and way of life by altering mindsets and working in collaboration for these certain changes to be real. Well, Audrey, Marion, Kaylin, and uh, Denise, thank you very, very much. Let me just say that um, I, I feel honored. I think we all feel honored that we had you not only at the session, but also tonight uh, to express your views and to bring up these important subjects. I'm actually really sorry to uh, say goodbye to you because I, I know you have to go to school. But um, if, um, if any of the um, participants would like to ask you questions, we'll record them and, um, and get them to you. Um, and thank you once again for rising so early in the morning uh, before a long school day. Thanks again. Um, I would now like to welcome uh, Ms. Ilse Brands Karis. Uh, she is a, the Secretary General for, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights and a very important actor regarding the treaty bodies system's future. Also because she has a firsthand experience and knowledge as a member of a treaty body until last year she was on the um, Human Rights Committee. 
So I, I'm looking forward to hearing from you um, um, what you see as the future direction of the treaty body system. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Yaffe, and, and dear chairperson, also um, friends, children, friends of all ages and colleagues. It really is a very great pleasure for me to be here with you today, uh, in, in part for the reason that, of course, I have a special place in my heart and my mind for the treaty bodies and the importance of the whole system of the treaty bodies, having had direct experience myself and followed very closely the development also of the special session of Samoa. So I wish to thank uh, the regional rights resource team for organizing this timely discussion. Uh, six years ago, the General Assembly reaffirmed the role of human rights treaty bodies in protecting and promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms, while acknowledging the need for reforms to ensure that the treaty body system continues to serve its purpose, to give life to the human rights commitments agreed upon by the international community. A number of measures were put forth in the Resolution 68-268 to strengthen and enhance the effective functioning of the system, such as the simplified reporting procedure, alignment of working methods across the treaty bodies, and shorter documents. Furthermore, uh, the formula for the allocation of resources and the establishment of the capacity building program were major innovations. The formula ensured that the treaty body system would be adequately funded and that allocations would be made on an objective basis. That is the number of reports and individual communications received. Yet states did not fully honor their commitment to the formula. In this regard, capacity is a critical impediment. The capacity building program of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has to date assisted more than 120 states, in particular small island developing states and least developed countries, to comply with their treaty reporting obligations. This includes providing technical assistance at the national level or by organizing sub-regional events, including for sharing good practices among states on the systematic implementation of human rights implement or recommendations. Today, we reflect on how these measures have strengthened the treaty body system and how we can ensure that the system remains relevant and effective. Over the past months, the co-facilitators of the 2020 review process of the treaty body system, the permanent representative of Morocco and the permanent representative of Switzerland held informal consultations with states treaty body experts, civil society, and other stakeholders to collect views and perspectives on a range of issues from the proposed fixed calendar and periodicity of treaty body reviews of state party reports to alignment of working methods and rules of procedures across the treaty bodies to the use of information and communication technologies to keep pace with technological development in our changing world. What we have learned is that there is consensus among member states and stakeholders that GA Resolution 68-268, if fully implemented, is still the appropriate framework for ensuring the effective functioning of the treaty body system. And that there is a common interest to take the proposals further by pursuing the discussion on relevant topics in order to build bridges reduce gaps and find a common landing zone that ultimately leads to a common consensual outcome. We look forward to these discussions in the General Assembly. Uh, one important topic of the process is the role of the treaty body reviews in the regions and the effective implementation of state human rights obligations. I'm pleased that the consultations highlighted I quote, the positive value of introducing state party reviews in the region as an important step towards increased domestic stakeholder accessibility, enhanced visibility of the treaty body system and closer interaction with national and regional human rights systems. The co-facilitators added that this could include inter alia organizing reviews of states in the UN regional offices follow up webinars on concluding observations, 
and sharing good practices on follow-up recommendations. In this regard, the 84th extraordinary session of the Committee on the Rights of the Child in Samoa is both historic and unique, not only because it was the first time it was done, but also because of the lessons to be drawn for the entire treaty body system. The review brought the system to a region that is most affected by its remoteness from Geneva, as the minister uh, mentioned, where state party reviews are usually held. The Samoan experience points the direction for the future of the treaty body system. First, treaty bodies should be visible and accessible for their constituents. In Samoa, the committee was able to hold in-person dialogues with state parties, unlike the usual modality of teleconferencing for this region, and benefit from the participation of more than 1,000 civil society, children, and other representative participants. Second, work for human rights protection cannot be done in isolation. The Samoa session was a massive team effort involving a dedicated partner, the regional rights resource team, a generous host government, visionary donor states, and strong interagency cooperation. While states have obligations under the human rights treaties, the implementation of human rights obligation requires the collective action and participation of all actors, including international and regional organizations, civil society, and also the private sector. Third, treaty bodies should be flexible. Not only had a session never been held in the regions before by the committee, but this first time also happened to be in a remote part of the world from Geneva's perspective. In the immediate aftermath of a tragic measles epidemic, and two cyclones in the region. And just as the world was beginning to shut down in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, administrative hurdles, flight cancellations, and school and border closures were just a few of the numerous challenges that had to be overcome. Now, more than ever, the treaty body system needs to be flexible and adapt its working methods to the changing circumstances. Finally, and critically, Children and youth are an indispensable partner in our work, and they must have the space to speak and to participate, as is their fundamental right. In Samoa, children helped shape the agenda and directly told the committee what issues are important to them, and we heard some of them just now. Because the committee had dedicated three full meetings of its Samoa session to speaking directly with children. Similarly, it had requested partners organizing side events to ensure that all events include children as speakers and as moderators. The Samoa session is an important example of the work of the United Nations in promoting youth and child participation in all aspects of life and directly at the place where it matters and with the active engagement of children and youth. While we cannot yet fully grasp the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, we already know that it is disproportionately impacting their lives, including their right to education, healthcare, water, food, and participation, and also to freedom from violence and abuse. For those in the most vulnerable and marginalized situations who live with disability, are deprived of their liberty, or live in a refugee camp, informal settlement, a place with armed conflict or simply on the street or do not feel safe at home, the right to speak may feel like a luxury or a dream. Across the world, we support states to implement laws and policies that guarantee young people's rights to be heard and to protect civic space so that children and youth are empowered to stand up for their rights and contribute to positive change. In close partnership with the Secretary General's Youth Envoy, we advocate for the empowerment and meaningful participation of children and young people in their communities and in the intergovernmental space, including those in the most marginalized and vulnerable situations. This year, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, the Secretary General launched a call to action for human rights because the human rights system helps us to meet the challenges, opportunities, and needs of the 21st century, 
as he said. In his words, human rights are our ultimate tool to help societies grow in freedom. And the human rights instruments articulate a social contract between all human beings by which everyone can live to their fullest potential. Let us renew that bond together by building a strong system of treaty bodies that learns from each other. And I look forward to learning from all of you. Thank you very much. Well, Ms. Uh, Brands Karras, thank you very, very much for your um, remarks, uh, highlighting the importance of the treaty body system, but also uh, reminding us um, that we serve rights holders in places where they live and how important it is that um, the reform that is undertaken be meaningful in this regard uh, beyond just the process of uh, uh, committees functioning and uh, allocation of funds, which of course is really important as well. Let me just quickly seize the opportunity to uh, signal that um, the chair of the Committee on the Rights of the Child is a spectator of this, um, of this uh, discussion and um, he's um, certainly very active in uh, pushing forward reform in a sense that is helpful to the rights holders. I now turn to um, Judge Clarence Nelson of Samoa, uh, my colleague and friend who serves on the committee. Now, Judge um, Clarence Nelson is a wonderful person, but he's also an oddity in the sense that he's the only and I mark my word, Pacific Islander ever to sit on any treaty body committee. And uh, Clarence played a cru crucial role, of course, in making the idea of the committee session in Samoa a reality uh, and creating thus another precedent for the ages. So what happened, Clarence? How did you manage this feat? And why did you pour so much energy into this undertaking? And do you have any regrets? The floor is yours, Clarence. Thank you, uh, Philip, and uh, good morning to uh, all my colleagues and good morning to everybody who's able to join us. Uh, it is morning here in the Pacific and uh, I'm so pleased to be a part of this uh, session. Uh, and I'm also very happy to see that the children uh, have played a role in this matter. Uh, well, I will take my cue from the children. They say we should get straight to it because obviously time uh, is not on our side, as we often say in our committee. Uh, how did it come about, uh, Philip? Well, uh, it started a long time ago uh, with an idea between, uh, floated uh, between myself and some members of the OHCHR staff when it first started in Suva over 20 years ago. But it's been uh, something that I've diligently pursued because I believe that this is the way to make the UN treaty body system and to make child rights issues the, uh, visible to countries and to stakeholders and to uh, people concerned in particular to the children. Uh, so I lobbied uh, uh, very hard, as you know, Philip, with uh, members of the committee for a long time to try and look at ways to move our sessions from Geneva out into the regions, out to where the people are, out to where the stakeholders are, out to where the governments are, and everyone is uh, concerned. And uh, it, it was just, I think, an alignment of many things of, if you like, an alignment of the stars. And the stars in this case, they're rock stars, all the people who made this thing happen. Uh, in particular, uh, I think firstly, the committee, the committee members themselves had to agree to this occurring. And my colleagues were always from day one, very responsive uh, to the discussion of moving a session out into a region. I mean, I hoped it would be in the Pacific region, but the discussion started with a region, any region. Uh, so the committee members fully supported this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, undertaking and without it, it would, would not have happened. It would also not have happened if the Office of Human Rights, the OHCHR in Geneva and in the Pacific region 
uh, didn't support it. They also came on board and, you know, the UN uh, system can be a little difficult to deal with sometimes. But I found that they were very supportive and with the efforts of uh, Miles and Ashley of the Triple R resource team of the Pacific community, uh, OHCHR came on board both from Geneva and locally in the Pacific. As well, we had the support of people like our United Nations resident representative, uh, Simona Marinescu here in Samoa. We had the support of people from the uh, UN office in Fiji uh, that, that uh, were fully behind it, as well as organizations, our partner organizations like UNICEF. Those, all those institutions had to also come on board for this thing to happen. In particular, of course, we had to have the support of a host nation. And in this case, uh, the government of Samoa was 110% behind having this brought to our shores to, to not only uh, showcase specific culture and specific hospitality, but more importantly, to also uh, showcase the bringing of a treaty body committee to a region and to a country and to its stakeholders. Uh, so the importance of a host, the importance of a host nation uh, is critical. And of course, very, very critical, and without it, nothing would have happened, was the support of the funders, uh, Philip. Uh, in this case, the support of various governments, not only the Samoan government as host nation, but also the governments of Sweden, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, and various other donor partners who supported uh, these initiatives, all coordinated uh, most wonderfully through the Triple R resource team uh, of the Pacific community who, who played the key role in bringing all these, as I say, rock stars together uh, to make this event happen. And finally, we had to have a uh, relevant program. Uh, and in this case, again, the stars aligned for us in that we had three Pacific countries that were coming up for review, as well as one Pacific country that was coming up for pre-session uh, discussions. So we had four Pacific countries uh, that we needed to uh, dialogue with. Uh, and uh, they were most appreciative that instead of having to pay the cost to travel so far to Geneva, which many Pacific nations cannot afford, uh, they were most appreciative that we would be coming to them for a change rather than them coming to us. Uh, we were also fortunate that uh, the Asian Development Bank, uh, who have never done this thing, this sort of thing before, as I, as I understand it, also came on board as a sponsor in relation to a special session on climate change. And climate change in the Pacific is, uh, is one of the most uh, pressive and imperative issues of our generation. And for that to happen, that became part of, again, a relevant program for the committee to undertake. Uh, and that's not to mention all the other side events and all the other benefits. For example, Philip, you staying on together with uh, our member colleague Bragi from Iceland, staying on after the meeting to visit Pacific countries in person uh, and, and make presentations and hold discussions. You know, these things are really, really important to small Pacific nations, uh, such as the nations that you visited. For them, it's a really big deal. So for all these rock stars to come together and to align, uh, that is what allowed this uh, session to be held in Samoa. And, um, you know, it, no regrets, absolutely no regrets. And I think uh, the session showed us so many things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, even, even in the committee, we still talk about the unprecedented involvement of children. Uh, Madam Secretary has referred to like a, a, a thousand children being engaged in this one way or the other. Uh, and that is, that is correct because they not only held competitions prior to the meeting occurring in Samoa, but they, there was uh, a notable excitement everywhere 
in the town of Apia that the committee was coming and children began to learn, some of them for the first time, about their rights as children and the convention of the rights of the child and the committee and its work, and especially about the UN, the UN system itself and the treaty body system itself and how that system works. Uh, a lot of them were not uh, aware of this beforehand. So uh, the value in that, I think, ongoing, as we've seen from the four children we heard from this morning, uh, is immense. Uh, and uh, you've also heard from the children how they were very, very actively involved in the committee session. We made an effort and Triple RT as the organizers and all the other organizers of the meeting made sure children were at the core of what went on. They uh, chaired some sessions, they were panelists, they participated in the many side events that uh, occurred every day and that the committee were able to join over its lunch hour. I mean, they worked us, Philip, they sure worked us uh, during that one week here, uh, not only with sessions and side events, but during lunch hours as well. And there was also a special session facilitated by the children themselves and the Asian Development Bank on uh, climate change, which was an eye opener for a lot of us because it involved children not only locally, but from around the region uh, and many, many other Pacific countries. Um, so there, there is no question that the uh, session was an outstanding success and that the value of regional sessions uh, has really emerged as the winner in, uh, in, in this exercise. Uh, it is, to use a colloquial phrase, uh, a way to get good bang for your buck. Uh, because while it may have been an, an, an expensive exercise, uh, in terms of the, the, the outcomes it has produced, it's been very positive. I'm sorry if I'm looking a little white, but the sun is now coming up in Samoa, so uh, uh, perhaps this is, I don't mean to look angelic or anything to everybody, but uh, <clears throat> you'll have to excuse the, uh, uh, let me just try to adjust my computer a little bit. Uh, the other final thing I want to add is, uh, what, what did CRC 84 show us? Well, it's been described that CRC 84 uh, was a game changer, and I think that is what it is. It is a game changer. It's a pointer to the future, especially in the world we live in today, where international travel is difficult. Uh, it has many challenges. And uh, you, perhaps we now have to look at things like, instead of global committees, perhaps regional committees that can hold regional sessions. Uh, this would alleviate a lot of funding concerns. Uh, this would also enable regional specialization into issues regionally uh, by regional communities. It's something to consider. One thing that is very, very sure and that came out of CRC 84 is the tremendous and immeasurable value of having face-to-face -face consultations. Uh, online meetings like this seems to be the way of the, of, of the moment but it should only be the way of the moment. The visibility and the impact of face-to-face -face consultations that occur cannot be understated. And I think CRC 84 showed us that uh, the value of having those face-to-face -face consultations with stakeholders, children, and people who are directly concerned uh, in the, and work in the area of child rights. Philip, I can go on and on and on uh, about more of the positive outcomes, but I, I, I would just like to leave it there for the moment and perhaps try to move my computer out of the sunshine, which is because <laughs> coming straight into my face. But thank you for the opportunity and thank you to uh, colleagues and thank you to the organizers uh, and, and Triple RT for making this uh, event uh, possible this morning. Thank you, Philip. Back to you. Thank you very much, Clarence. <clears throat> You've been uh, very gracious um, doling out uh, congratulations, but 
in very short, uh, we're very indebted to you and you've created hundreds of rock stars in Samoa. So all those children have benefited from uh, the hard work you've put into this, uh, Clarence, and thank you very, very much. I was reminded recently by uh, Oris Novosad, who is uh, a key person uh, at uh, OHCHR, of all the good work that the secretariat of the committee uh, put in, but uh, also how much um, uh, uh, Miles Young and the contingent of SPC staff put in as well. A lot of uh, sweat went into um, putting up this meeting. And uh, I would like to introduce Miles Young, uh, who is the director of the new human rights and social development division within SPC. And he will share not only the complex undertaking that was managed with multiple partners, but more to the point, he will also, I hope, uh, share the main takeaways and the comprehensive review that was undertaken uh, during the meeting and afterwards. And uh, those are really significant elements for the future of the work we do. And so, Miles, if you could go into some detail on that, we'd be very happy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair Philip. Uh, Yandra Vinaka, good morning from Suva Fiji and um, Nava Levu. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, Philip, I know that uh, we, uh, we're uh, coming toward the, to the hour um, and I've been asked to highlight some of the outcomes of CRC 84, uh, but in the interest of time, and I know others have touched on some of these outcomes, so maybe I'll touch on perhaps two, uh, three, no more, I think. Um, but I will refer to the report on the Psalm 1 session, which um, I believe has been emailed to those who have registered for this panel discussion. And this report um, provides good analysis of some of these outcomes, or, or, or sorry, the, the outcomes of the session. And I'd encourage people to, to have a look at this report. Um, there's been reference to the review of the future workings of the treaty body system. And I hope um, this report that I referred to will, will help inform, uh, inform that review. So just quickly turning to the outcomes, um, you know, perhaps the most significant outcome of CRC 84 was the participation of children, who are of course the primary beneficiaries of the convention. Um, my friend Justice Nelson said the unprecedented engagement of children, it really was unpre uh, unprecedented, um, I, I think more than 300 children engaged with CRC 84 in Samoa. Uh, throughout the week, the committee was in session and Audrey, Marion, Kaylin and Denise have spoken very elegantly and very passionately earlier about their participation. And I think the profound effect um, it had on them. You know, the program was designed to ensure their meaningful participation and the children really delivered. Um, Justice Nelson um, has said that um, uh, you know, they were at the center, they were at the core of the program, and it really was the case. Um, uh, you know, they, they moderated and led side events, um, they presented before the committee, um, they attended and made interventions at side events, and perhaps most impressively, um, was the uh, very open and very honest discussion of sensitive and complex issues which affected them. Issues like culture, faith and human rights. Uh, corporal punishment was discussed in some detail. Early childhood development, climate change, of course, um, so on and so forth. Um, you know, their role as rights holders and, and agents of change. Now, if you read the report uh, that I referred to, you will see that, um, you know, the interviews with the children for the purposes of that report reveal that they clearly felt uh, empowered uh, by their involvement and they came away knowing more about their rights and, uh, and, uh, and with a much better appreciation of human rights more generally. So, you know, I think that outcome in and of itself made the, the whole event um, worthwhile. 
But, uh, you know, there were other very positive outcomes of CRC84. Um, a second outcome, which uh, is highlighted in the report, was that committee members themselves, I think, came away from Samoa with a much better appreciation of child rights issues in the Pacific and with a much better appreciation of the region more generally. And I think this can only have a positive effect on their work uh, moving forward. You know, the opportunities for committee members to engage with children, um, with the various civil society representatives that attended, uh, country delegations outside of the formal session, uh, I think provided them with the, um, with the background and the context to the issues and challenges unique to the Pacific. And I think this had the effect of enhancing the quality and the relevance of the dialogue within the formal session um, itself. And I think feedback from the committee members and this feedback was, I believe, unanimous, was that the knowledge uh, gained from this enhanced engagement uh, during and, and outside of the formal session um, exceeded expectations. I think one of the comments was um, to quote, uh, if I can recall this correctly, uh, this just would not have happened or would not have been possible in Geneva. Um, you know, being in the Pacific, in the region, working in situ, uh, enabled committee members to, to live the moment, uh, to better appreciate the context in this part of the world. Um, and I think this translated into uh, concluding observations that were more relevant, uh, contextualized, and, and practical. Um, a third outcome very quickly was the increased public awareness in, in Samoa and the Pacific of the committee, uh, its work on the convention itself and human rights more broadly. Um, you know, a survey conducted during the session showed that close to 90%, I think it was around 88, 89% of respondents to the survey reported increased knowledge of child rights and about 86, 85% of respondents said they learned something new about the convention. So it played a very uh, educational role. Um, there was significant media coverage across the Pacific. I mean, throughout the week in Samoa, there was consistent reporting in the two national daily newspapers on television uh, and also in the regional news services, um, you know, for a week, children's rights and human rights more generally took center stage um, in the media in Samoa. Imagine that, having human rights and, uh, and children's rights taking center stage in the media for a week, uh, consistent reporting, consistent coverage. It really elevated human rights uh, in Samoa and across, and across the region. Uh, as has been alluded to earlier or mentioned earlier, committee members after the session use the opportunity of being in this part of the world, in a very remote uh, part of the world relative to the rest of the world, um, to make outreach visits to Fiji and Vanuatu. Uh, again, raising awareness of the committee and its work and of human rights uh, more generally in these countries. I mean, our chair, Professor um, Jaffe and, and Bragi Goodbranson, um, who I believe is online with us this morning, they met with ministers uh, and other senior government officials they met with civil society organizations. Uh, they met with school children themselves. They paid visits to orphanages, um, to a school for children with disabilities. Um, they had the opportunity to speak to the general public via public lectures um, at the Regional University of the South Pacific. So they both had very full outreach programs in Fiji and Vanuatu. And, and just quickly touching on a fourth outcome, I see that um, time is running away. Um, attendance at CRC gave civil society organizations the opportunity to spend quality time with each other, to establish new connections, strengthen existing connections, and to learn through the site events uh, more about engagement opportunities with UN mechanisms. Um, you know, civil society organizations from seven Pacific Island countries attended Samoa. The costs of attendance would have been prohibitive had the session been held in Geneva. So um, uh, interesting also, uh, government officials from Nauru and Fiji attended um, the session. 
These countries were not scheduled to report to the committee, but for them, this was a learning opportunity. It was an affordable opportunity to learn firsthand how constructive dialogues are conducted and um, to prepare themselves when they report to the committee. So they took this opportunity. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm conscious of the time. I know the panel is keen to take questions from before, so let me stop there. But first, uh, before I do that, can I just say Navalevu to the co-sponsors of the event uh, to, uh, of this event, um, to Chair Luis uh, Perdinera, who's online, um, and CRC members, and Orest Noasad and his team at OHCHR in Geneva. Thank you for taking the chance and partnering with us to bring um, CRC 84 to the Pacific to the sponsors, uh, donor partners, and to delivery partners, UNICEF Pacific and um, the UN resident coordinator in Samoa. And I see that Simona Marinescu is online. Nava Levu, thank you very much. Oh, finally, sorry, one other thing. I shouldn't, I shouldn't forget two members of my team who played a key role in helping to bring the committee to Samoa. Ashley Bow, Rose Martin, take a bow, Naka. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Miles, uh, for uh, reminding us of um, everyone who was involved, and there are many more that are not named, but uh, who contributed uh, greatly. And, but also, in particular, for bringing up some of the main uh, elements of what turned this uh, improbable session into a resounding success. Actually, I'm a little bit jealous because, um, in a way, I host. Uh, the committee in Geneva, not technically because it's at the UN, but being a member of the the, the, the host country. And uh, I don't think we can put up so, something as wonderful as you did in, in Samoa, even if we tried. Anyway, um, I, I would like to, to move along a little bit faster before we get to the Q&A portion. We still have one uh, brief uh, video message uh, from the honorable, uh, uh, Mitch uh, Fifield, who is the uh, permanent representative and ambassador to the United Nations of Australia. And it is very important to hear from him because along with uh, New Zealand, uh, Sweden, the UK, United Kingdom, uh, these countries were uh, the backbone in terms of uh, donors uh, for this session to take uh, part. Not the only ones, but the main ones. And so I would like to hear from him in his video message on uh, why it's so important for these countries, these state parties to um, support this type of project. Can we have the video? G'day. Thanks for the invitation to take part in this side event and for the opportunity to add Australia's perspective to the discussions today. Australia was very pleased to support the decision to hold CRC 84 the 84th extraordinary session of the Committee on the Rights of the Child in Samoa. As we all know, this was the first time a UN treaty body held a regional review session outside New York or Geneva. I applaud the efforts of the regional rights resource team and the governments of the UK, Sweden and New Zealand, each of which also supported this initiative. And I want to recognise the personal efforts of Miles Young, the Director of the Regional Rights Resource Team and of uh, Justice Vui Clarence Nelson of Samoa in driving what really was a history-making initiative. The Pacific, like any region, has its human rights challenges and, uh, of course, that includes Australia. But our region has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate a strong commitment to promoting and protecting human rights. One measure of that commitment is the current Pacific representation on the Human Rights Council. Australia was very pleased to be joined on the HRC by Fiji in 2019 and then the Marshall Islands this year. Three years ago, there had never been a Pacific country represented on the HRC and now there are three. The Convention on the Rights of the Child is another great example of the Pacific's commitment to human rights. Every state in the Pacific has ratified the CRC. Pacific countries are also parties to many of the other international human rights treaties. And of course, we participate in the HRC's universal periodic review process. So the commitment of our region to human rights, to international human rights law and to accountability is clear. 
But what is not always clear is the extent of the challenges that treaty body reporting obligations can present for the states of the Pacific. Most obvious is the challenge of geography. The time it takes to get from some Pacific islands to Geneva is measured not in hours, but in days. It can take four, five, six separate flights. Even travelling from Australia takes a good 24 hours. So that's a significant investment of time and that's not even including the financial cost of all those flights. And then there are the challenges of meeting the regular reporting obligations. I know from Australia's experience that this is a significant undertaking. From Australia's perspective, it's of the utmost importance that the treaty body system operates as efficiently as possible. For these reasons, Australia strongly supports the review of the treaty body system, and we look forward to the Secretary General's report. We need to ensure that parties to treaties are not having to direct limited resources solely towards complying with procedures instead of focusing on human rights compliance. We need to ensure that we are not inadvertently putting obstacles in the way of states that are genuinely interested in improving their human rights situations. And we need to ensure that we do everything we can to remove the obstacles that do exist. This is why Australia supported CRC 84 in Samoa. This recognition of the challenges faced by Pacific states and the inclusivity it represents is a valuable contribution to removing obstacles to human rights compliance. We urge all treaty bodies to do the same by bringing their work to the region. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And um, I um, would like to uh, invite uh, very briefly um, Miss Julia Feeney, if she's uh, online, to uh, perhaps give a live remark, compliment to what the ambassador shared. She is the deputy representative, the permanent representative at the UN. Is Miss um, Feeney uh, online? Hi, Philip. It's Julia here. And um, thank you for all the contributions uh, in the panel. Um, I must just say that uh, I think Justice Nelson referring to the CRC 84 as a game changer. I, I think that's apart from the wonderful um, inter interventions by the children. I think that's the, that's my takeaway from this. It's just such a unique opportunity. And I'm sure that for the um, committee members, it was just as much of a learning experience for them as indeed for the NGOs and the children in Samoa. So thank you very much. And I, like, um, like uh, Mitch Fifield just mentioned, would really like to see more and more of the treaty bodies coming out to our region. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for, for that, uh, for that uh, intervention. Um, before, um, now, let's make it clear. We, we would like to welcome a few questions. We have one or two that are already in the pipeline. And, um, but again, let me remind you that you're not really allowed to leave until we have the final video by the, um, put the performance by the uh, Samoan NGO Brown Girl Woke, um, which uh, we witnessed as committee members uh, live in uh, Apia and which is really worth it. It's not very long, but it's worth the wait. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists before uh, people peel off, which again, they're not allowed to. But um, uh, let, me, let me be a little bit of a, a, a spoiler uh, in the sense that um, we heard a lot of positives. And uh, by any measure, I, I subscribe to the idea that this was a resounding success for the rights holders, for the UN system, for the state parties that participated and for everyone um, involved. But uh, what, what, could we, what could we do better? What, what are the criticisms that we could bring to this experience? And uh, I'm gonna shoot that question to, to, to Miles uh, because you uh, were the most intimately involved uh, in the um, organization uh, the person on the panel that's most uh, involved. If you can do some um, 
uh, self-criticism, uh, well, not yourself, but I mean, of the team and, uh, and the process and the outcomes. Um, that would be really helpful also for future meetings. And let me throw in another question uh, for everyone. Uh, would, that be, would it be useful to think of multiple regional meetings with smaller groups of uh, committee members uh, that take place uh, on an ongoing, on a more frequent basis? Um, anyone can answer that question, but Miles, first to you. Uh, th thank you, Philip. Uh, yes, look, there were lots of positives, but what can be improved? I think one thing that could have been improved was the involvement of children from across the Pacific. We did have significant involvement of children from Samoa, uh, and that's to be applauded, but I think uh, we could have had um, better representation of children from across the region, uh, including from those countries that uh, appeared before the committee. Um, so that's one area I think that we can improve. Um, I know that um, because the event was held in Samoa, there was a lot of media coverage of, um, of the issues, um, human rights related and children's rights related issues in Samoa. Um, and so I think there may have been a perception that Samoa was under review. So I think we could have, as the organizing team, worked to, um, to address uh, any perception that Samoa was under review. Um, so that's another issue. Um, I think we could have had a bit more, if we had a bit more time, we would have been able to to cover those issues a, a bit more. Um, but of course, um, you know, this was the first occasion something like this had happened. Uh, it's always good uh, to, uh, you know, we all have the benefit of, of hindsight to, 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 to look at the lessons and these are covered in this report, which I again would urge uh, people to, to consider. Um, other members of the panel, including Justice Nelson, might uh, and, and yourself, Philip, um, m might have uh, other additions to make. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to put the question to uh, uh, Ms. Brands Karras in terms of uh, the treaty body reform process. If she sees some value in terms of, um, if she's still online, and I hope she is, um, organizing smaller groups of uh, of committee um, members um, being more frequently in regional settings, if that's something that would be um, a uh, good lesson learned to, to increase the presence at a regional level. Do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you very much, Philip, if I may. Now we are all colleagues and friends, as we said. Um, I do, thank you very much for the question. Oh. You're, you're on. Do you have, oh, I am sorry, because I got something on the screen. No, I, I think, you know, this is of course the first and historic situation that we're learning from. So the analysis is very important. I think the ideas of having various ways of really reaching out into the regions, of course, has been part of all of the stakeholder discussions, as we know, um, in, in relation to the treaty body review. And I think that that needs to go on. Obviously, again, we cannot have one system that will work for all of the treaty bodies. But it's clear, one thing I think that we can hear from you and that we can agree on, that what we expected to be the case, which is that the value of actually going out in the region has been confirmed. And that, as you said, that it's valuable both for for committee members themselves, because you really get a sense of the context and a different understanding of, of the issues. Um, and, and also for all of the stakeholders there. And, and plus the very important point that I think it, the points you have been making that the awareness of rights of the child, the awareness of the existence of a treaty body system and of the UN itself, of course, is, is a key point that is brought. And I don't think that that was only, that, that is really for all stakeholders, including 
not only the children, but their parents and their teachers and, and, and their government for that matter, because as we know, we find that we are at the heart of everything that needs to be done with human rights, but of course that we find that that's not always the case. But I think that the value is undoubtedly clear. And then the format of it is of course, something that has to be adjusted. And in smaller groups, I certainly know that for the human rights committee, this was also discussed because just in terms of the practicality of bringing an entire committee all the time to the regions, you know, might, might pose some particular challenges. So there may be ways of working around this by having, by having smaller groups. Um, I, I would say the one caveat to all of these wonderful and creative ideas that need to be pursued and, and is two. One is that as a former treaty body member, I would also stress, of course, the independence of the treaty bodies and the fact that the decisions around it and finding those working methods, even in this whole alignment period, should really be led um, by, by the treaty bodies themselves. So they should not be imposed on treaty bodies. Um, and that is of course something that we also need to look at in the treaty body review uh, period. Um, at the same time, of course, the secretariat, and I myself uh, here in New York and certainly in Geneva and, and all it was mentioned, but certainly the entire secretariat for treaty bodies is very happy to support the process so that really collecting the information and being very much part of the treaty body review as, as, as we are as well. But the other caveat is, of course, sadly, coming back to, I mentioned when I, my, my intervention, the four formula that never worked, meaning the shortage we have in terms of resources to be able to match that. And of course, unfortunately now, as you know, with COVID, this uh, and the whole uh, budget crisis and liquidity crisis uh, that we are facing, um, it's, it's more urgent than ever to make sure, because this wonderful experience, of course, could not have happened without the support of those very visionary, great, uh, donor countries who saw that this was something definitely worth exploring. And I think that given the responsibility of states to support the treaty body system, the obligations are there, then of course the issue is how do we make sure that there's a regular budget that is adequate for the treaty body system to be able to function the way it should. So that's another, another well, maybe not caveat, but another point that we need to continue working on, I'd say, and really hope that this will come through. But with those, those special conditions, I certainly think that exploring it in various formats, and no doubt to learn the real lessons, we have to have different models and they can be compared and analyzed. And certainly the one of potentially having smaller groups, but really making sure that it will be. The, the scheduling, of course, is another issue then, of, because I understand that the good practice of this example is also because there were several countries in the region that were under review. So there's also the issue of scheduling and making sure that that makes sense um, in, in that way too. But certainly very happy to keep thinking through together with all of you and to keep exploring and learning from the lessons and just going ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ilze, thank you very much for being a friend of the treaty bodies. Um, it's in your DNA and you can't get rid of it. Uh, also for reminding us that there are many moving parts. Um, but from a human rights perspective, and I want to put this question to Clarence, and then I have a follow-up uh, for uh, Simona Marinesco. Um, Clarence, I, my feeling was that it was less uh, states, parties reporting to a committee on the implementation of a convention than a group of human rights specialists taking part in a empowering process. And to me, that's a, a completely different role of the committee that I don't think we're really carrying out when we meet at the Palais Wilson in Geneva. What do you think? Thank you, Philip. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a bit of both. I, I think it was, uh, Yes, there was uh, reporting on uh, compliance with the CRC, uh, but there was also, as you have correctly noted, uh, an empowerment process uh, that was uh, unfolding. And uh, again, uh, the point's already been made. It worked both ways. I, I think in terms of, uh, from our point of view as committee members, uh, uh, the, the, you know, uh, to, 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 to be in this sitting, 
and to have people be able to discuss things, not only during the formal sessions, but outside the formal sessions, uh, it, it enriches the conversation and puts, uh, puts a very um, essential context on how Pacific nations respond to the UN treaty body system, how they respond to concluding observations, how they view the uh, treaty body system, all those things. Things that we don't necessarily cover in our formal sessions, uh, but it was an opportunity to also explore those areas. So I think it was a bit of both. It's a mixture uh, of um, empowerment, learning and reporting. So, hey, that's a great cocktail. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Um, Simona Marinescu, would you like to um, introduce yourself and um, make the comments that you would like to make? And just to say that you've been a big part of this process as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you, can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Philip, thank you so much. Uh, ambassadors, uh, minister, distinguished members of the uh, CRC, uh, Justice Nelson, um, ASG, um, all protocol observed. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention that um, it was indeed a great honor for the UN country team in Samoa to have been the first host of the CRC ever. And in that regard, I would like to thank Justice Nelson as well as the government of Samoa for making it possible. I guess in response to your question, Philip, this was a moment of truth for the United Nations um, in Samoa and in the region, as um, we have um, had the opportunity for the first time to hear from the children of the country. At the time, we've already had a series of important uh, initiatives uh, designed and uh, under implementation, the Spotlight Initiative to End Violence Against Women and Girls, as well as the Social Protection Program funded by the fund and uh, some other uh, initiatives that are very, very relevant to the topics that the CRC covers and the Convention on the uh, Rights of the Child uh, covers without having had such an opportunity to listen from children, uh, from the children themselves. So uh, the first lesson uh, for sure was how powerful these um, youngest uh, members of the society actually are. It's quite comforting to see how engaged they are, how knowledgeable, how passionate about the issues that the country uh, is facing uh, at, at present and, and in the future. So we are really in good hands uh, with, with our younger ones at the helm um, of our future. Then of course, um, uh, the importance of empowering them. I just want to mention that uh, in one of the events at the UN General Assembly celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UN, um, there was a request that we very much value from the UN family that um, we set a threshold of 20% participation of youth in the public life of their nations, given the importance of looking at sustainable development as a goal that will benefit, um, again, the, the younger generations of our countries. So we very much hope that that will take place. The, um, the, the uh, CRC and the outcome of this unprecedented uh, event that Samoa hosted was also presented at the voluntary national review that Samoa went through uh, this year in July at the high level political forum. Very importantly, what I wanted to share here is that whatever children have shared together, of course, with uh, relevant organizations has been confirmed by the um, um, demographic and health survey that was completed uh, and launched very recently, the DHS mix as we call it in the United Nations for 2019-2020, that indeed revealed some of those issues pertaining to um, uh, education and uh, um, access to and the right to a peaceful family environment, the right to immunization and, and health care, and more generally the uh, uh, right to basic services. If we look at the data, we realize that children are very much aware and an important dialogue partner to identify such issues. So we look forward to working again with all our partners um, into um, addressing the issues as reflected into the report of the CRC, as well as into 
uh, again, the data that we have been able to collect together with the government of Samoa, with the Samoa Bureau of Statistics. I would like to end by mentioning that it was also extremely important to us to um, acknowledge uh, the presence of a great partner in the Pacific, which is the um, Secretariat of the Pacific Community. I remember with much pleasure our session with, with many sessions with uh, Young, with Miles Young and with uh, uh, Oras Novosad and, and Allegra and Ashley, I'm also naming colleagues from the OHCHR um, into the preparation of the session, but also hopefully into taking forward some of the uh, conclusions and uh, addressing uh, some of the needs. Uh, I will conclude by saying that um, another lesson for the UN family was that with uh, the absence of many of the normative organizations of the United Nations on the ground, since they have a very limited footprint, uh, uh, bridging uh, the uh, treaty bodies with the societies that are supposed to, again, take forward the ratified conventions is extremely valuable. So we very much hope that other countries will host in the future CRC sessions and not only uh, the CRC, the CEDO and, and other committees, um, looking into implementation of treaties and we stand ready to share uh, those lessons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simona. Um, and uh, thank you to all the panelists um, for your in insightful um, comments and um, remarks and proposals and, uh, and memories um, and also um, ideas for the future. We have uh, a last um, uh, a portion of this event, which is the video by the um, Samoan NGO Brown Girl Woke, and I look forward to seeing it. And once it's over, you're allowed to freely leave the session and go back to their, your basic uh, duties. And I uh, hope to see you in this case, let me put it, unfortunately, in a way, I wish we could meet again in Samoa next year, but I also hope we can meet in Geneva for our next session of the CRC um, in my home country. So um, thank you again. And uh, please, uh, let's put the video uh, of the NGO on. Bye-bye. Where are you now when darkness seems to end? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? Oh, I, I, I hear you say, I hear you say, look up, child. No.
concludes our uh, performance for today. In case anyone forgot, we are Bronco Woke. Thank you for everything, and have a good afternoon. Thank you.